Hello, today is January the 4th, 2022, and thank you for joining me on my uh, YouTube channel, Maxi Millionaire Jr. Again, that's the name of my great grandfather. So, my dad's grandfather is, so, is just a grandfather. Now, my grandfather's dad is my great grandfather, just for those who don't know how to, uh, properly uh, hierarchy their family members anyways today we're gonna continue reading the book or actually no not continue but start the uh, book that I have just grabbed from my personal library by the way I have a lot of books to go through with you guys because I'm a book reader I love reading books so this book is called uh, Jerusalem. It's a, uh, it's a biography by Simon uh, Seabag Mon Montefire. So uh, let's let's get through some of the uh, plot summary of what this book's gonna be about. Because to me, books are like movies. They're movies. I remember uh, I remember when I was in third grade, my best teacher was. Uh, uh, Miss Monica, she was a, a a woman. Even to this day, I could recall she was one of the most good-looking teachers I've ever had. And keep in mind, I was in third grade. I was eight years old, and I was already checking her out. So I believe this uh, uh, mentality of of checking women out comes from. A very young age either either you uh, you got that talent from people who showed you who showed you how to do it which is completely normal as long as you're not committing adultery checking people out is not a sin right I don't know who told you that verse about if you look at a woman lustfully you already committed sin today I tell you that's wrong if you want to believe something else, you go right on ahead. But you're not going to change my mind. You got it? Also, you're in my YouTube channel. If you don't like it, you go on and go watch Teletubbies on another YouTube channel, right? You're here to learn from me. Not to uh, not to be here uh, trying to change my mind. Nobody's going to change my mind. For I follow only the Bible. And the Bible only. Right? So here we go. This is a book I had uh, bought a couple of uh, couple of uh, years back. Costing me $21. Can you believe that? $21. Keep in mind, I make $15 an hour right now. Dishwashing. These hands are deteriorating. I wash dishes for a living. My little hands are going extinct because I'm dipping them in water that it's 140 degrees, sometimes 160 degrees, which is something you'll never feel unless you're a dishwasher. May God bless you if you're a dishwasher. For we should be making as much money as doctors should. That's right. You heard it from me first. All right, so here we go. Uh, the plot summary of the Book of Jerusalem is about uh, a man, a man named Simon Seabag. Now, who is Simon Seabag? Let's just get through uh, who is Simon Seabag real quick. Uh, I believe there's a little brief intro about who is Simon Seabag in here. I just love how crispy books pages are. Look at that. One thing about me reading physical books is that I like grabbing the tips of my fingers and you're just going like that. You see the just the edge. Even if it means that you're gonna get paper cut. I get paper cut all the time, but the trick is to just gently, gently go like that. Don't don't force it because sometimes there's fat people that just like going like that, you know, they cut themselves on purpose, but you got to be gentle. You got to be humble. You got to go like that. Look, See? 
And once you get to that uh, corner page, you go like that, and then it lifts itself up. Look at that. See? And once you have one page, you just crisp it. You see? And that's where you get that savory flavor of reading. You know? Because reading is holy. Reading makes your brain grow. Uh, anyway, so let's see. Uh, family trees, preface, nope, I don't want to read the preface, I just want to read about the author, uh, Jerusalem, prologue, don't want to read the prologue, where is about the doctor, I mean the author, Judas, the world of David, I can read the back, I remember there was a, a brief, Index, index, index. Bibliography, bibliography. Let's see, we're in the back pages. Notes to pages, notes to pages. This book has more than 600 pages here. Apparently, it has more than 600 pages. Can you believe it? I just wish I could read fast enough to read it in one day. But it's funny because your brain can't even calculate that fast, you know? Oh, look, it has an epic large. Maybe we could find something about this guy. Maybe. Let's see, epic large, epic large. Everybody has two cities. Nope, not gonna find anything here. It's in the front page. Look at that. So if you ever buy this book, it's in the front page. Second page. Alright, so who is Simon Seabag? Monty Fire. Simon Seabag Monty Fire. Or Fire. Or however you want to pronounce it. Because honestly, when, when I was in school, even the teachers say that it it don't matter if you pronounce the name right, you know. Your parents didn't give the teacher uh, a correct pronunciation on how you want to be uh, called, you know. It's however the teacher could call you as a sheep, you know. For all I care, the teacher should be calling you a sheep if you're a student. Look, if you're attending a school where the teacher is teaching you, you're already a sheep. You shouldn't even have a name. You should be called a sheep. Right? If you want to be called properly by your name, you go pay for a private school or something. Have your parents teach you. All right, here we go. Simon Seabag Monty Fire. Jerusalem. Simon Seabag Monty Fire is a his historian of Russia. And the Middle East. Catherine and the Great... Pontican, the Imperial Love Affair, was shortlisted for the Samuel Johnson Prize. Stalin, the Court of the Red Tsar, won the History Book of the Year Prize at the British Book Awards. Young Stalin won the Los Angeles Times Book Prize for Biography, the Costa Biography Award from the United Kingdom, and the Le Grande Prix de la Biography Politique in France. Jerusalem, the biography, was a worldwide bestseller and received the Jewish Book Council's Jewish Book of the Year Award. His most recent book, The Romanos, won the liter uh, liter Literary Prize or Literary Literature. Literary Prize. Lupicaia del Terizio in Italia, in Italy. Montefiore's books are published in more than 48 languages. Can you believe that? This guy's books are published, published in more than 48 languages. Just think about that. How many people this guy is influencing? It doesn't matter if only one person buys the book. 
What matters is that he has influenced one out of 48 languages, people. So let's say there was 48,000 people who bought this book in English. What's the point if he only taught one language? What's more important is that he taught in other languages, which there are many others, just like people who speak English. That want to be translated this message. Mountain Fire's books are published in more than 48 languages. He is the author of the Moscow trilogy of novels such as. Saskanga, One Night in Winter. Which you won the Patty Power uh, Political Fiction Book of the Year Award in 2014. And Red Sky at Noon, a fellow of the Royal Society of Literature, Dr. Montefiore graduated from Cambridge Univers University where he received his uh, physical degree to become a doctor. He lives in London, or also known as PhD, capital P, lowercase h, capital D, PhD. He lives in London. He has a website. www.simonsebagmontefire Spelled M-O-N-T-E-F-I-O-R-E dot com. Simon Seabag Montefiore is available for speaking engagements. To inquire, please visit his other website www.prhspeakers.com All right, here we go. Chapter 1. First of all, let's go through a couple of contexts that we're going to be reading through this book. It's called Jerusalem. The book of context uh, is, is, is a very fun part for me because it gives you like a, a skip of availability. Just like when you watch a movie, you know, you get to skip through your favorite episodes, you know. But in a book, the table of context so, uh, shows you what chapter you could skip right into. So you can uh, start reading about that specific part of the movie. But you got to put your brain into. You got to put your brain into the uh, literature. So part one is uh, based on Judaism. Part two is based on paganism. Part three is based on Christianity. Part four is based on Islam. Part five is based on the crusade. Spelled C-R-U-S-A-D-E. Part 6 is based on the man luck, spelled M-A-M-L-U-K. Part 7 is based on the Ottoman. Part 8 is based on the empire. Part 9 is based on Zionism. What exactly is Zionism? So today we're just going to skip straight forward to uh, chapter 9 because chapter 9 is something that... Uh, it's very biblical about what's going on in these churches. Uh, for example, uh, one of the churches that I'm going to right now is uh, World Mission Society Church of God. They have a website too. You could check it out. It's at the www.watv, uh, the for vacation, dot org. All right, so here we go. Chapter 9. Zionism, huh? Mm -hmm. It's a very long chapter, man. I'm telling you. The British mandate. The Empire. Alright, there we go. Part 9. 
Zionism, spelled Z I O N I S M. O Jerusalem, the one man who has been present all this while, the lovable dreamer of Nazareth, has done nothing but increase the hate. Theodore Hersey Diary quoted there. Theodore Hersey. Uh, from the book of diary quoted that uh, old Jerusalem the one man who has become present all this while the lovable dreamer of Nazareth has done nothing but increase the hate Arthur Koesler uh, uh, quoted uh, the angry face of Jawe is uh, brooding over the hot rocks which have seen more holy murder rape and plunder than any other place on this earth. Another quote comes from um, David Ben Gurion, press interviewer. He quoted, If a land can have a soul, Jerusalem is the soul of the land of Israel. Another quote. Another quote comes from Winston Churchill, The Second World War, Volume 6, Triumph and Tragedy. He quoted, no two cities have counted more with mankind than Athens and Jerusalem. Another quote comes from uh, John Tilt, spelled T-L-E-E-L. -E -E John Tilt. I am Jerusalem. Jerusalem Quarterly is the book that he apparently wrote. But in that book, he quoted... It's not easy to be a Jerusalemite. A thorny pad runs alongside its joys. The great are small inside the old city. Popes, patriarchs, kings all remove their crowns. It is the city of the king of kings. And earthly kings and lords are not its masters. No human can ever possess Jerusalem. And last but not least, a quote coming from Rudyard uh, Kipling uh, from the book that he wrote called The Burden of Jerusalem. Uh, he quoted, And burdened Gentiles, or the main, must hear the weight of Israel's hate, because he is not brought again in triumph to Jerusalem. Alright, here we go. Chapter 42 from part 9. Keep in mind, this book has chapters, but divided by parts but we're in part nine which talks about zionism in this book there's a chapter 42 which speaks of the kaiser 1898 through 1905 hurls spelled h-e-r-z-l it's a man we're gonna read about theodore hurls spelled h e r H E R Z L Theodore Hurls, a, liter a, a literary critic in Vienna, was said to be extraordinarily handsome. His eyes were almond shaped with heavy black, melancholy lashes. His profile, that of an Assyrian emperor, an unhappily married father of three. He was a thoroughly assimilated Jew who wore winged collars and frock coats. He was not of the people and had little connection to the shabby, ring-lettered Jews of the Shetel, spelled S-H-T-E-T-L-S. -E he was a lawyer by training, spoke no Hebrew or Jidish, spelled Y-I-D-D-I-S-H. Put up Christmas trees at home and did not bother to circumcise his son. But the Russian programs of 1881 fundamentally shocked him when in 1895 Vienna elected the anti Semitic rabble rouser Karl Luger as major. Hurls wrote The mood among the Jews is one of the despair. That same year, he was in Paris covering the Dreyfus Affair, in which an innocent Jewish army officer was framed as a German spy, and he watched Parisian mobs 
shrieking more ox juice in the country that had emancipated Jews. This reinforced his conviction that assimilation had not only failed but was provoking more anti-Semitism. He even predicted that an in, in, in anti-Semitism would one day be legalized in Germany. Hurls concluded that Jews could never be safe without their own homeland. At first, this half pragmatist, half utopian dreamed of a Germanic aristocratic republic. A Jewish Venice ruled by a Senate with a Rothschild as princely dog, spelled D-O-G-E, and himself as a chan chancellor, chancellor. His vision was secular. The high priest will, uh, quotation mark, will wear impressive robes, quotation marks. The Hurl's army will not boast curiosers. Spelled C U I R A S S I E R S with silver breastplates. His modern Jewish citizens would play cricket and tennis in a modern Jerusalem. The Rothschilds, uh, initially skeptical of any Jewish state, rejected Hurl's approaches. But these early notes uh, soon mature into something more practical. Palestine is our ever memorable historic home, he proclaimed. The Jewish state in February 1896, the Maccabees will rise again. We shall live at least or at last as free men on our own soil and die peacefully in our own homes. There was nothing new about Zionism, even the word had already been coined in 1890. But Hurls gave political expression and organization to every and very ancient sentiment. Jews had envisaged their very existence in terms of their relationship to Jerusalem since King David and particularly since the Babylonian exile. Jews prayed towards Jerusalem, wished each other next year in Jerusalem, each year at Passover, and commemorated the fallen temple by smashing a glass at their weddings and keeping a corner of their houses undecorated. They went on pilgrimage there, wished to be buried there, and prayed whenever possible around the temple walls. Even when they were grievously uh, persecuted, Jews continued to live in Jerusalem and were uh, absent only when they were banned on pain of death. The new European nationalism inevitably provoked racial hostility towards this supranational and cosmopolitan people. But simultaneously, the same nationalism, along with the liberty won by the French Revolution, was bound to inspire the Jews too. Prince Potemkin, Emperor Napoleon, and U.S. President John Adams all believed they all believed in the return of the Jews to Jerusalem, as had Polish and Italian nationalists and of course the Christian Zionist in America and Britain. Yet the Zionist pioneers were Orthodox rabbis who saw the return in the light of Messianic expectation. In 1836, an Ashkenazi rabbi in Prussia, spelled Z-V-I, V, Hirsch, spelled Z -V -I -H I R S C H Kalisher in eighteen thirty six an Ashkenazi rabbi in Prussia Zv Hirsch Kalisher approached the Rothschilds 
in Monson Fires to fund a Jewish nation and later wrote his book Seeking Zion. After the Damascus blood uh, label, quotation mark, Rabbi uh, Jehuda Hai El Shelai, a uh, Sephardic rabbi in Jare Yevo, suggested Jews in the Islamic world should elect leaders and buy land in Palestine. In 1862, Moses has a comrade of uh, Karl Marx predicted that uh, nationalism would lead to racial anti-Semitism. In Rome and Jerusalem, the last national question, which proposed a socialist Jewish society in Palestine, yet it was the Russian uh, programs that were decisive. We must reestablish ourselves as a living nation, wrote Leo Pinsker, an artisan physician, in his book, Auto Emancipation, writing at the same time as Hurls, he inspired a new movement of Russian Jews. The lovers of Zion, the Hovavin Zion, to develop agricultural settlements in Palestine. Even though many of them were uh, secular, our Jewishness and our Zionism explain a young believer, uh, Chaim Weissman, were interchangeable. In 1878, Palestinian Jews have founded Pira Tiva, spelled P E T A H T I K V A H. In 1878, Palestinian Jews have founded Pita Tikva, a gateway of hope on the coast, but now even the Rothschilds in the person of the French Baron Edmund, started to fund ag uh, agricultural uh, villages such as Rishon, Le Zion, First and Zion, for Russian immigrants. Altogether, he will donate the princely sum of 6.6 .6 million, like mountain fire. He tried to buy the wall in Jerusalem. In 1887, the Mufti Mustafa Al Husini agreed a deal, but it fell through uh, when Rothschild tried again in 1897. The Husini uh, Sheikh Al Haram blocked it. In 1883, long before Hurl's book, 25,000 Jews started to arrive in Palestine in the first wave. Alaya spelled A L. I, Y, A, H, of immigration. Most, but not all, were from Russia. But Jerusalem also attracted Persians in the 1870s. Gemini's in the 1880s. They tended to live together in their own communities. Jews from Bakhara. Spell B O K H A R A, including the uh, Musafir family of jewelers who uh, had cut diamonds from Genghis Khan, settled there on uh, Bukharan Kur Kur Corridor that was carefully uh, laid out in a grid. Its grand, often neo Gothic. Neo Renaissance, sometimes uh, Moorish masons, mansions, designed to resemble those of Central Asian cities. In August 1897, Hurls presided over the first Zionist Congress in Bos. Spelled B A S L E. And afterwards, he boasted to his diary, quotation marks, Letal says Moi, Al Baos, I founded the Jewish state. If I said this out loud today, I will be greeted by universal laughter, perhaps in five years, and certainly 
50, everyone will know it. They did, and he was only five years out. Hurls became a new species of politician and publicist, riding the new railways of Europe to canvas kings, ministers, and press barons. His relentless energy aggravated and defied a weak heart liable to kill him at any moment. Hurls believed in Zionism, not built from the bottom by settlers, but granted by emperors and financed by plutocrats. The Rothschilds and Montifiers initially disdained Zionism, but the early Zionist congresses were ornamented by Sir Francis Montefiore, Moses' nephew, a rather footling English gentleman who wore white gloves in the heat of the Swiss summer because he had to shake so many hands. However, Hurls needed a patent to intervene with the Sultan. He decided that his Jewish state should be German-speaking, and so he turned to the very model of a modern monarch, the German Kaiser. Wilhelm II was planning an oriental tour to meet the Sultan and then proceed to Jerusalem for the dedication of a new church built close to the sepulchre on the land granted to his father, Kaiser Frederick, but there was more to the Kaiser's plan. He prided himself on his diplomacy with the Sultan and saw himself as a protestant pilgrim to the holy places. Above all, he hoped to offer German protection to the Ottomans, promote his new Germany and counter British influence. Quotation mark, I should go to the German Kaiser. Let our people go decided Hurls and resolved to base his state on this great, strong, moral, splendidly governed, tightly organized Germany. Through Zionism, it will again become possible for Jews to love this Germany. Wilhelm, spelled W-I-L-H-E-L-M, Wilhelm, the parasites of my empire. The Kaiser was an unlikely Jewish champion. When he heard that Jews were settling in Argentina, he said, Oh, if only we could send ours there too. And hearing about her Zionism, he wrote, I'm very much in favor of the marshals going to Palestine. The sooner they clear off, the better. Although he re uh, regularly met Jewish industrialists in Germany. And became friends with the Jewish ship owner, Albert Ballin. He was at her, a heart, an anti Semite who ranted against the uh, poisonous hydra of Jewish capitalism. Jews were the parasites of my empire, who he believed were twisting and corrupting Germany. Years later, as he deposed monarch. He will propose mass intermination of the Jews using gas. Yet Hurl says that the anti-Semites are becoming our most reliable friends. Hurl had to penetrate the Kaiser's court. First, he managed to meet the Kaiser's influential uncle, the Grand Duke Feirich of Baden who was interested in a scheme to find the Ark of the Covenant, but then wrote to his nephew, who in turn asked Philip, Prince of Eulenburg, to report on the Zionist plan. Eulenburg, the Kaiser's best friend, ambassador to Vienna, and political mastermind, was fascinated by Hurl's pitch. Zionism was a way to extend German power the Kaiser agreed that the energy, creatively, creativity, and efficiency of the tribe of Shem would be diverted to worthier goals than the sucking dry of Christians. 
Wilhelm, like most of the ruling class of that time, believed that the Jews possessed a mystical power over the workings of the world. Our dear God knows even better that we do that Jewish killed our Savior and he punished them accordingly. It shouldn't be forgotten that uh, considering the immense and extremely dangerous power which international Jewish capital represents, it will be a huge advantage to Germany if the Hebrews looked up to it in gratitude. Here was the good news for uh, Hurls. Everywhere the uh, hydra of the gas, gas list anti-Semitism is raising its dreadful head and the terrified Jews are looking around for a protector. Well then, I should intercede with the Sultan. Hurls was ecstatic. Wonderful, wonderful. On 11 October 1898, the Kaiser and Kaiserin embarked on the imperial train with a retune including his foreign minister, 20 couriers, 2 doctors, and 80 maids, servants, and bodyguards. Anxious to impress the world, he had personally designed a special white-gray uniform with a full-length white crusader-style veil. On October the 13th, Hurls with four Zionist colleagues set out from Vienna and Orient Express packing a wardrobe that included white tie and tails as well as a pith, helmet, and safari suit. In Istanbul, Wilhelm finally received the Zionist womb, whom he judged to uh, be an idealist with an aristocratic arist aristocratic mentality clever very intelligent with impressive eyes the kaiser said he supported hurls because there are users at work if these people went to settle in the colonies they could be more useful hurls protested uh, protested at this uh, colony the kaiser inquired what he should ask the sultan for a charter company under German protection, replied Hurls. The Kaiser invited Hurls to meet him in Jerusalem. Hurls was impressed. The Hohenzollern, spelled H-O-H-E-N-Z-O-L-L-E-R-N. Hurls was impressed. The Hohenzollern personified imperial power with his great sea blue eyes, his fine serious face, frank, genial, and yet bold. But the reality was different. Wilhelm was certainly intelligent, knowledgeable, and energetic, but he was also restless and inconsistent that even Eulenburg feared he was mentally ill. After sacking Prince uh, Bismarck as Chan Chandler, he took control of Germany politics, but he was too unstable to sustain it. His personal diplomacy was disastrous. His written notes to his ministers were so outrageous that they had to be locked in a safe. His alarmingly articulate speeches in which he encouraged his troops to shoot German workers or to massacre enemies like Huns were embarrassing. Already by 1898, Wilhelm was regarded as half Buffon, half Warminger. Nonetheless, he proposed to sign his plan to Abdul Hamid. The Sultan rejected it firmly, telling his daughter, The Jews may spare their millions. When my empire is divided, perhaps they will get Palestine for nothing. But only our corpse can be divided. Meanwhile, Wilhelm, dazzled by the vigor of Islam, lost interest in Hurls. At 3 p.m. on October 29, 1898, the Kaiser rode through a breach 
specially opened in the wall next to Jaffa Gate and entered Jerusalem on a white charger. The Kaiser and Hurls, the last crusader and the first Zionist. The Kaiser sported the white uniform with the full length gold treaded burning veil sparkling in the sunlight. Flowing from a spiked helmet so uh, surmounted with a uh, burnished golden eagle escorted by a cavalcade of giant Prussian uh, hussars in steel helmets waving uh, crusader style uh, banners and the sultan's lancers in red waistcoats, blue pantaloons and green turbans and armed with lances. The Kaiserin in a patterned silk dress with a sash and a straw hat follow on behind him in a carriage with her two ladies in waiting. Hurls watched the Kaiser's performance from a hotel filled with German officers. The Kaiser had grasped that Jerusalem was the ideal stage on which to advertise his newly minted empire, but not everyone was impressed. The dull wager Russian and press thought his performance revolting, perfectly ridiculous, disgusting. The Kaiser was the first head of state to appoint an official photographer for a state visit. The Crusader uniform and the pack of photographers revealed what Allenberg called the Kaiser's two totally different natures. The nightly reminiscent of the finest days of the Middle Ages and the modern. The crowds reported the New, the New York Times were uh, dressed in holiday clothes. The city men in white turbans, gaily striped tunics, the wives of Turkish army officers in gorgeous silken uh, melayes, the well-to-do peasants in flow, uh, flowing caffins of flaming red, while uh, bedewing the fine steeds were largely clumsy red boots, a leather girdled over uh, a tunic filled with an arsenal of small arms, and a hef yet. Their shikes carry spears with a uh, burst of ostrich feathers around the blade. At the Jewish triumph arch, the chief Sephardi rabbi a uh, bearded uh, nonagenarian in white caftan and blue turban. His Ash Kenasi counterpart presented Wilhelm with a copy of the Torah. And he was welcomed by the mayor, Jasin al Khalidi, in a royal purple cloak and a gold encircled turban. Wilhelm dismounted at Davis Tower, and from there, he and the impressed walked into the city. The crowds cleared for fear of anarchist assassins. Impressed Elizabeth of Austria had recently been assassinated as the patriarchs in the influence of their jewel-encrusted regalia showed him the sepulchre. The Kaiser's heart was beating Faster and more fervently, as he as he trod in Jesus' footsteps. While Hurls waited for his summons and explored the city, the Kaiser dedicated the Church of the Redeemer with its uh, Roman uh, Romanesque tower, a structure that he had personally designed with particular care and love. When he visited the Temple Mount, the Kaiser, another enthusiastic archaeologist, asked the Mufti to allow excavations, but latter politely demurred. On November the 2nd, Hurls was finally summoned for his imperial audience. The five Zionists were so nervous that one of them suggested taking a bromide, dressing appropriately in white tie, tails, and top hats. They arrived north of the Damascus Gate at the Kaiser's encampment. 
This was a luxury Thomas Cook village with 230 tents, which had been transported in 120 carriages, borne by 1,300 horses, served by 100 coachmen, 600 drivers, 12 cooks, and 60 waiters, all guarded by an older man regiment. It was, said the tour maestro John Mason Cook, the largest party gone to Jerusalem since the Crusades. We wept the country of horses and carriages and almost of food. Punch mocked Wilhelm as Cook's crusaders. Heralds found the Kaiser posing in a gray colonial uniform, veiled helmet, brown gloves, and holding, oddly enough, a riding crop. The Zionist approached, halted, and vowed. Wilhelm held at his hand very uh, affably and then lectured him, declaring the land needs water and shade. There is room for all. The idea behind your movement is a healthy one. When Hurls explained that uh, laying on a water supply was visible but expensive, the Kaiser replied, Well, you have plenty of money, more money than all of us. Hurls proposed a modern Jerusalem, but the Kaiser then ended the meeting saying, Neither yes nor no. Ironically, both the Kaiser and Hurls loaded Jerusalem, a dismal red heap of stones, wrote, wrote Wilhelm, spoiled by large, quite modern. Suburbs formed by Jewish colonies. 60,000 of these people are there, greasy and squalid, cringing and abject, doing nothing but trying to fleece their neighbors for every farthing. Shylocks by the scores. But he wrote to his cousin, Russian Emperor Nicholas II that he despised the fetish adoration of the Christians even more. In leaving the holy city, I felt profoundly ashamed before the Muslims. Hurls almost agree. When I remember you in days to come, O Jerusalem, it won't be with delight. The musty, uh, the musty deposits of 2,000 years of inhumanity and tolerance and fallness lie in your reeking ollies. The western wall, he thought, was pervaded by hideous, miserable, scrambling beggary. Instead, Hurls dreamed that if Jerusalem is ever ours, I clear up everything not sacred. Tear down the filthy uh, rattles, preserving the old city as a heritage uh, as, as a heritage site, like Lourdes or Mecca. I build an airy, comfortable, properly sewered, brand new city around the holy places. Hurls later decided that Jerusalem should be shared. We shall ex extra Jerusalem so that it will belong to nobody and everybody. It's holy places, the joint possession of all believers. As the Kaiser departed down the road to Damascus, where he declared himself the protector of Islam and endowed Saladin with a new tomb, Hurl saw the future in three Early Jewish porters in Kaftans. If we can bring here 300,000 Jews like them, all of Israel will be ours. Yet Jerusalem was already very much the Jewish uh, century in Palestine. Out of 45,300 inhabitants, 28,000 were now Jewish, a rise that was already worrying the Arab uh, leadership. Who can contest the rights of the Jews to Palestine? Old Joseph Khalidi told his friend Jarrah Khan 
chief rabbi of France in 1899, and I quote quotation marks, God knows historically it is indeed your country, quotation mark. But the brute force of reality was that Palestine is now an integral part of the Ottoman Empire. And what is more serious, it is inhabited by other than Israelites. While the letter predates the idea of Palestinian nation, Khalidi was a Jerusalemite, an Arab an Ottoman, and ultimately a citizen of the world, and the necessity to deny the Jewish claim to Zion. He foresaw that Jewish return, ancient legitimate as it was would clash with the ancient and legitimate presence of the Arabs. In April 1903, the Kishneve pogrom, backed by the Tsar's interior minister, Via Cheslav von Plegivi launched a spree of anti Semitic slaughter and terror across Russia. In panic, Hurls traveled to St. Petersburg to negotiate with Plevi himself, the ultimate anti Semite. But getting nowhere with the Kaiser and the Sultan, he started to look for a provisional territory outside the Holy Land. Hurls needed a new backer. He proposed a Jewish homeland either in Cyprus or around El Arish in Sinai. Part of British Egypt, both of them locations close to Palestine. In 1903, Nady spelled N-A-T-T-Y in 1903, Nady, the first Lord Rothschild, who had finally come round to Zionism, introduced Hurls to Joseph Chamberlain, the British colonial secretary, who ruled out Cyprus but agreed to consider El Arish. Hurls hired a lawyer to draft a charter from the Jewish settlement. The lawyer was the 40-year-old liberal politician David Lloyd George, whose decisions would later alter Jerusalem's fate more than those of anyone since Saladin. The application was turned down, much to Hurl's disappointment. Chamberlain and Prime Minister Arthur Balfour came up with another territory. They offered Uganda, or rather part of Kenya, as a Jewish homeland. Hurls, who was short of alternatives, provisionally accepted. Regardless of his failed attempts to win over emperors and sultans, Hurl's Zionism had inspired the persecuted Jews of Russia, particularly a boy in a well-off Lord's family in Blonsk, spelled P-L-O-N-S-K. Regardless of his failed attempts to win over emperors and sultans, Hurl's Zionism had inspired the persecuted Jews of Russia, particularly a boy in a well-off lawyer's family in Plonsk. The 11-year-old David Grung thought Hurl's was the Messiah, who would lead the Jews back to Israel. And that's chapter 42, which ends on page 399. Again, this is chapter 42, which is the Kaiser in 1898 to 1905. The name is Theodore Hurls. A literary critic in Vienna was said to be extraordinarily handsome. His eyes were almond shaped with heavy black melancholy lashes. His profile that of an Assyrian emperor. And just and just like this chapter ends with the saying that an eleven year old David Grun thought that Theodore Hurls was the Messiah who would lead the Jews back to Israel. We can see through this book called Jerusalem Simon Seabag Montefire that there will be many people that will come as the Messiah. 
Now, why does this matter? It's because in today's world, there are many churches that they say that they are the Messiah. And many more will come, as says in the Bible, that they will claim to be the true Christ. But again, one must truly do the deep research. Even to this day, uh, it is January the 4th, 2022. Uh, I still believe that uh, the World Mission Site Church of God, which I'm currently attending to in, in, in uh, here in California, in Sunland to be specific, is to be uh, one of the true churches that there is to uh, come and to believe because just as there is the belief that if one man can do such power, one has to believe that um, if he has done so much work to be able to reach all over the world, just like the World Mission Society Church of God has done, then why not believe, you know? Why not give it a chance and push the limits to see how far uh, this so-called Messiah can go, you know? Of course, many of them will will say and don't test your Lord, but of course, it's not testing; it's just put into uh, evidence. So, therefore, there's a man in Korea whose name is An Sang Ho. Founded the church in 1964, and in 1985, before he died and traveled to China, by the way, he was married to a young woman. Named Jio Jia, also known as God the Mother in Korea, who by the way is still alive. To me, this belief is very strong in my heart, even to this day. For it says that in the beginning there was Adam and Eve who were without sin. And in the last days, Adam and Eve, spiritual Adam and Eve, will appear and seek all of the children from the beginning. Now remember, don't confuse Adam and Eve's uh, story of the world, which they say they were the first humans on the earth. That right there is not fact. What's fact is that God built the world God had already built the world way before the fact is that actually God had already built the world as we know it. Before Adam and Eve even existed, God had already built the world. And who knows, maybe this continent of America was connected to Europe, you know, and there wasn't no Atlantic Ocean. Who cares? Who cares, you know? Maybe that's all made up, you know, because honestly, the story of dinosaurs, I don't believe it. Could be the fossils are not even real. It's just, it's, it's just oil coming out from the earth. But here's the fact about the world, you know. This is a globe I bought a long time ago. I even put my signature here. See, I wrote it there because I bought it with my hard-earned money. This thing cost me 30 bucks. Anyways, let's say in Africa, right? Let's say uh, God was already making human beings. There was cavemen, whatever. 6,000 years ago, there was cavemen. Ooh, ooh, ooh. They're animals. They're reproducing. And sure, we could say there's both male and females already. And they did revolutionize, like, like the scientists say. They revolutionized from bacteria coming from the ocean, whatever. Bacteria made them... They turn into apes. Apes that started uh, evolutionizing into human beings. Finally, they were almost close to being perfect humans. 
the belief in the Bible is that when Adam and, Adam and Eve were first here, is that the conscience of their beliefs was that of a godly one, that God gave them that knowledge as being individuals, as being godlike, having the the righteous conscience of knowing what's good and evil. For we know cavemen were just ambitious animals. So therefore, the story goes that Adam and Eve, who were without sin, they came into this earth because they were looking for their children. So therefore, God turned into man. In the book of John, God turned into the flesh to come be like one of us through Jesus Christ, right? Time passed by. God let us be who we are, kings and emperors, just like Rome. And then in the year 2000, a man named Christ, he said, I am the word that became flesh. And then Christ was crucified in the year 33 AD, which he was 33 years old. Which, by the way, I believe uh, one has to be 33 years old to be able to, to be able to, to be able to uh, be considered an adult. Not like America or the United States has it that... Uh, a male person and a female person They turn adult when they're 18 That's made up actually That right there is a made up age 33 years old is the age that I believe That you should be considered an adult Before 33 you're still a teenager So What happened is that after Christ died at the year of 33 The world was Already being evangelized By the belief that uh one has to carry their own cross, meaning one has to uh, carry their own sacrifice in this earth. Because in this earth, there are many temptations. There are riches, there are lust. Women, by the way, who uh, I just read a story on, um, on, uh, on based on sexuality. Which, by the way, sexuality is godly, you know. God knows the pleasure of sexuality, you know. That's why they say women... Are more pleasure in sex because they're the ones that have more uh, uh, whatever word that is uh, testosterone or whatever feeling. Anyways, that shouldn't matter, you know. But what the real matter here is withstanding that temptation, withstanding the t temptation of lust, withstanding the temptation of money and power of the world because. That's what it means. That that's what it means to carry your own cross. And this is what I mean by the World Mission Society Church of God being the true church. Because keep in mind, Korea is a hermit kingdom. Let's say let's say the belief of Christianity was big here. But remember, the Asians, they're people like like the cavemen. Like let's say Africans, right? African people we all know the racial slur that's going on in the world. We don't like them because they're black and we think they're ugly. There's that movie in the uh, uh, Fast and the Furious. Fast and the Furious with the uh, two Mexican guys. Actually, they're from Puerto Rico, but they speak Spanish. They say uh, to the uh, African-American guy who comes out in Transformer. I always forget his name. They tell him uh, in Spanish. They tell him, fail is fail, both in English and Spanish. It means Ugly is ugly, you know, you can't change ugliness, you know. So anyways, let's say Africa was really the first people who were out here in the world. Black people, right? Whatever. In the year 2022, now we are considering them to be one of the most holiest people, actually. Because we are starting to realize that human beings are really equal. You know, there's no, there's no such thing as one nation being higher than another race. Blah, blah, blah. Korea, on the other hand, are like those Africanos. We, we actually consider them to be very ugly people, just like the Chinese. Now, am I saying I'm the one that's saying it? I'm going, I'm going with the flow of what the articles online say. You know? So, in Korea, there was this man named An Sang Ho, who, by the way, he wasn't very good looking. He wasn't very good looking. He went through the war of Korea. 
His whole life, he established a house, a church, for believers to go there. Can you believe it? For believers to go there. When he died in the year 1985, he left the church and trusted to a woman named Shang Yo Ya, who to this day, uh, 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 that one man, Aung San Hong, said, follow her because she is your mother. And that's it. That's all he left. And to this day, I live in Los Angeles, and honestly, I heard this message in 2014. And I'm still uh, doing research on whether this is true or false. But keep in mind, that woman in Korea, the believers of the World Mission Society Church of God, consider her to be the Jerusalem. This Jerusalem that you see here is the physical Jerusalem that is in Israel. Which the whole world is now fighting for because they think it's the birthplace of Christianity, Judaism, and Islam. But the belief in Korea is that the Jerusalem is a new, a new Jerusalem, but not a physical one, but a spiritual one, of a conscious one, the same conscious that came in Adam and Eve in the beginning of the world. Now it is your choice to believe or not. Just like in the movie The Matrix, you have a blue pill and you have a red pill. Each pill represents one thing, heaven or hell. It is your choice to believe, my friend. Until then, I am your host, Javier Diaz. You heard it here first. Just like in the movie 2012, that one crazy guy who was homeless in his automobile home. Because it wasn't permanent, remember? Just like I'm living right now, I'm, I'm living in a tent. This home isn't mine. It's my landlord's. So, just like the guy in 2012, you heard it here first. From your local evangelist Bible reading. Homeless men on this earth. Because remember, I have to go to work to be able to keep this shelter under my house. I mean, under my head. If I, if I wish I could actually retire... And not work a single day in my life. But now, you know, next week I got to go to work. Do work that I don't even want to do just to survive. And yet I get some criticism from brothers and sisters. Unknown Gentiles about how I live my life. Excuse me on how I live my life. You live your own life because Christ said that every person on earth is a Christ now when he came. He said all 8.5 million people on earth are Jesus. And if that Jesus wants to live an evil life, you let him live an evil life. Because it's not your life. You live your own life. In the next world, God's going to say you chose the pill on what kind of life to live. Remember that. Until next time, your host.